got really quiet. Good morning. morning. It's good to see everybody in the Lord's house this morning. Good to be here. A little rain to start off the morning, and hopefully, uh, well, that might have been your alarm clock, um, as it was mine when that thunder rolled through. So it wakes you up, gets you ready to go. So uh, it's good to be able to come together and and to worship this morning. And uh, we're just uh, so thankful that you're here. We want to welcome those of you online. And I hope that we just are ready to uh, lift up our voices, uh, to hear the word of God open, and to listen to what it has to, he has to say this morning. So let's go ahead and stand together as we open up by singing the song forever. Give thanks to the Lord. God, we thank you for this morning that we can come together, uh, that we can just just sing praises to you, Father, that we can join as one body, Father, under one spirit, under one God, because there is no other way to heaven but through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for that price that he paid on Calvary, and we thank you, Lord, that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, that we have that hope of eternal life because that gap has been bridged. And Father, that someday, should you tarry and we die, that we will be with you in heaven, rise up to glory. And Father, we just pray a blessing on this service. In Jesus' name, I pray. Oh, my. 
shall be my eyes. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No Continuing to worship this morning, Psalm 27, 4 tells us, This is what I seek, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple when I look into your holiness. I 
And every week, we do take that opportunity to remember what Christ did on the cross for us. So as we gather together and we prepare to partake of communion, let's be singing, Lead Me to Calvary. A lot of times I do a meditation, I go through and think of things and uh, put it together, and I was just, happened to be reading some Christian standard stuff, and I came across this, and uh, it made it kind of easy because it was written out for me, uh, but I thought it was really good, and, and I like uh, what he titled it. He titled it, uh, and the author is Doug Redford, he titled it, <clears throat> No Tourniquet required. This is what he says. Some time ago, a newspaper carried a story about a woman who called 911 after a medical port dislodged from her arm. Blood was spurting everywhere, she recalled. The EMS unit that responded was equipped with a new tourniquet that was designed for military use. This new design, said a fire chief quoted in the article, locks into place so that it doesn't become loose or shift during transport to the hospital. It does a much better job of stopping the flow of blood. In this case, the tourniquet helped save a woman's life. Stopping the flow of blood when a serious injury occurs is what we do to save life. For the loss of too much blood will result in death. The Apostle Paul described the cup of the Lord's Supper as, quote, a participation in the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. That the outpouring of Jesus' blood was not halted meant death for him, but life for us. Jesus cried out as he was dying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the separation that Jesus experienced meant renewed fellowship with God for us, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 13. 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus could have provided the equivalent of a tourniquet. He could have called 12 legions of angels, that's 72,000 of them, to come and rescue him from his enemies. You can find that in Matthew 26, 53. But the love of God had decreed that the blood of Christ should flow that day. No tourniquet devised by man would have been strong enough to stop it. It is never accurate to say that Jesus' life was taken from him. He made clear that he gave his life. As he says in John 10, 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay down of my own accord. The prophet Zechariah used the image of a fountain to picture the continual flowing of the blood of Christ that still carries the power, quote, to cleanse them from sin and impurity, Zechariah 13, 1. William Cowper expressed that the truth in the words of a widely known hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood, filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you did not call the legions of angels to come and rescue you, but that you gave your life for us, that you spilled your blood for us, that you were the perfect sacrifice for us. Bless these emblems as we remember that time together, as we remember what you did for us because you loved us that much. Please bless the bread that represents Christ's body and the juice that represents his blood as we partake together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we continuing continue to worship. Let's stand as we sing together, Beautiful One. Nothing on earth is 
is as beautiful as you. You opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Beautiful one I love. Beautiful one I adore. Beautiful one my soul. said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I was trying to think of something for this week and the bar has been set really high at the last couple of weeks. So I thought, how can I even get close <laughs> to getting there? And I thought, well, I'll just show them. I'll just let God tell it. So <laughs> I've got, I Googled uh, verses on offering and I come up with six pages and 12 point font. Luckily for you, I'm only going to share two of them, <laughs> but these are all Bible verses. And I specifically only picked Bible verses from the old Testament because I wanted to make sure that we all know that this has been around since the beginning of the Bible. It is not something new. So I'll start with uh, Genesis 4, 4. And Abel brought the best, the choicest parts of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. This one really struck me. I'm not going to talk about too many of these, but Genesis 8.20. Then Noah built an altar, altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is after the flood. He only had two of each to start with, and now he's sacrificing some of them. I mean, come on. I guess now we know where the dinosaurs went, right? For, <laughs> For, three, for the three annual festivals, Exodus 23, 19, Moses tells the people, the best of, your, of the first fruits of your ground, and you should bring, let me start that one over. For the three annual festivals, Moses tells the people, the best of the first fruits of your ground, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Exodus 35, 4, 5, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let them bring the Lord's contribution. Exodus 25, 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. Exodus 35, 21, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred them and everyone whose spirit moved them and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for its service and for the holy garments. Leviticus 27, 30, every tithe of the land. Whoever, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 23. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year and before the Lord your God and in the place that he will choose to make him dwell there, to make his name dwell there. And you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Deuteronomy 16, 16 and 17. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Psalm 4, 5. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 56, 12. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thanks offerings to you. Psalm 61, 8. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Psalm 96, 7 and 8. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering, and come into his courts. 
Psalm 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Psalm 116, 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Proverbs 11:25. whoever brings blessing will be enriched and the one who waters will himself be watered. And my all-time favorite, Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Notice that in all of those verses, all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, nobody was forced. Everybody did it joyfully, joyfully and they did it of their best. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to this por in this portion of the service to give back a portion you have blessed us with. Lord, we just pray that you will use these blessings to reach people not only here locally in Alexandria, but around the world. In your name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. We are turning our attention now to prayer, to be mindful of needs, whether you read them in the bulletin from weeks past, um, some additions perhaps this morning. Um, we are continuing to lift up uh, Ellie Phil's brother, Edward, uh, plus and minus, up and down. So it seems like one step forward, two steps back. You know, he's out of ICU uh, for now, so that's an improvement, but then some struggles. So appreciate continued prayers uh, for Edward. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else in the room to share. Debbie? Okay, thankful for her sister's biopsy to be normal. Okay. All right, keep in prayer for surgery in November. Kathy? Okay, doing better, thankful for being healthy. Eve? Okay. Okay, so remember Todd's dad, Shell Markley, for biopsy on his liver. Glad that his pacemaker surgery went well. Let's go ahead. I, I just, I'll give you a, a few moments to just be praying silently. Just speak to the Lord personally, and then I'll close. Heavenly Father, as we would uh, spend these moments, we would be uh, reminded of how you hear us uh, each and every day, uh, every moment, every opportunity. Thank you for the privilege and, and the power of praying to share our thanksgivings and, and our concerns to uh, give you uh, our struggles uh, and our victories. Thank you for the way that you continue to stay by our side uh, no matter what we endure in the day or the week. Thank you for this time and place, for all the many efforts that, that go into providing this environment. We pray that we would be able to read and hear, uh, understand and apply uh, your gospel. It is, it is shared through songs and meditations, through classes and study. We just pray that you would continue to bless and provide for our missionaries as they are serving in often very difficult circumstances. May we uh, lift them up to you this week. Uh, thank you again for the gift, uh, the sacrifice, the example, the, the promise of our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Last week, uh, during that same prayer time, we asked that you would be praying for the family of Dr. Jack Cottrell, uh, who passed away recently. And I want to put a picture up of he and his wife, uh, Barbara. Uh, I'm talking his, his obituary starts out exactly as most do. You know. Jack Warren Cottrell, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, went to be with the Lord on September 16th, 2022. 
Jack was born on April 30th, 1938 in Minersville, Kentucky, the son of Major and Jewel Mitchell Cottrell. He is survived by his wife of 64 years, Barbara Gordon Cottrell, his son, his daughters, grandchildren, great grandchildren, etc. No. Says Jack, an avid University of Kentucky basketball fan, graduated from Stamping Ground Kentucky High School in 1955. And here's where it starts to kind of take a unique trajectory. He then earned degrees from the Cincinnati Bible Seminary, A.B. 1959, University of Cincinnati, A.B. 1962, Westminster Theological Seminary, M.Div. 1965, and Princeton Theological Seminary, Ph.D. 1971. During his college years, he also ministered to churches in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Jack taught in the Graduate School of Cincinnati Christian University for 49 years while holding weekend ministries, speaking in colleges, and on more foreign mission fields, which include Canada, the Philippines, Egypt, Brazil, Mexico, and Venezuela. Jack is the author of 43 books many of which have been translated into 15 languages. It took me about two seconds to pull five of those titles off my own shelves because I knew exactly where they were because I've used them all. He authored countless articles and consulted on other scholarly works, which included, hear this, the Book of Romans for the English Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Okay. Just, just so we're clear. The black-covered Bible that's in the rack in the chair in front of you, when the staff went to, the translators went to make sure that they were correct with the Book of Romans, they called Jack Cottrell and said, can you check this? That's the individual we're talking about. So why would he have such a long battle with cancer? Why, why would God allow a man who has obviously contributed in a great way to the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God be allowed to suffer like that? And you know the answer. It's the same reason he would allow you or me or his son, Jesus, to suffer. You know. Earlier this year, Dr. Cottrell updated his many Facebook followers on his condition, and this is what he wrote. We must be ready someday to say goodbye to these bodies and to wait with Jesus in the angelic heaven for the time when he will give us new glorified bodies that are forever free from that curse. Thus, while we are facing death in this fallen world, it is okay to pray for healing in the extension of life plan A. <laughs> But to remember that if God chooses not to answer these prayers, as a plan A plus <laughs> waiting for us, which is Romans 8:18. 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Thus we are waiting eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. Verse 23. Hallelujah. It, it, isn't that where we want to be? I, I call his attitude like the, the grown-up Christian <laughs> mindset towards death and dying. Mature believers think that way. We want to have that outlook. You might say, I want to grow to that point. But to be honest, I'm not quite there yet. And suffering is still a reality and an obstacle in my world. I don't, have you ever just wondered, <laughs> why is there so much suffering in the world? And if you mean a skeptic, they will use that to question the existence or deny the existence of God altogether. Or they'll question the character of God. They'll say, uh, if he exists, why would he allow such? Is, is he toying with you? Is he tormenting you? Why, if your God exists and he's good, I'd say, why, why do terrible things happen? All right? Philosophers frame it this way. If God is all-powerful, he could destroy evil. If God was good and loving, he would destroy evil. And yet, evil exists. So perhaps your God isn't good. Or he isn't all-powerful. Or he doesn't exist. They said this was a pretty witty cynic. What's a nice God like you doing in a universe like this? You know? 
And this is area, like Chuck talked about, you know, the, the idea of giving has been since the beginning. Likewise, we're not the first generation to think up hard questions and throw them at God. Right? Ecclesiastes 9, 11. Uh, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man that knows when his hour will come, as fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare. So men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. You may have been there. Habakkuk cries out, chapter 1, verse 2, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out, violence, but you do not see? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Somebody's thinking, <laughs> sounds like our house. You know? <laughs> Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so the justice is perverted. Go clear, fast forward to the end of the Bible. Souls waiting, as Dr. Cotter described, Revelation 6.10. They called out in a loud voice, how, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? and avenge our blood. You know, how do we reconcile the, the three statements? They're all true. God is good. Evil exists. God is all-powerful. You know, Philip Yancey wrote a book, Where is God When It Hurts? He says, hey, our arms are too short to box with God. Job tried, chapter 42, verse 3. This is Job speaking to God. <laughs> uh, you asked who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. Job is one of those guys who did literally like shake his fist at God and then kind of got shocked when God said, let's talk. Uh -huh. uh, and and these, these questions about evil and suffering have been asked for centuries. Typically our answer is framed in free will. Look, God allows all of us to, to choose. He could, make it. he could make us all, force us to submit and choose righteousness. We'd all be little marionettes, little puppets on strings, and some people would gripe about that. Right? I didn't get a choice. I just had to do it. You know, most of us don't love it when your spouse or your kids love you out of obligation. You know? So God allows all of us to choose, and some choose evil. They do wicked things, and God doesn't stop us. And then we have a group that complains and gripes about the existence of evil and suffering. You're like, look, you, you can't have it both ways. Freedom always brings risk. There's an interdependence of, of human life, and that provides us opportunities to love and give and serve, and that's the same opportunity for other people to hate and take and harm. It happens. Sometimes the sins of, of a person in power or, or a wicked generation does bring pain and hardship to other people. Another person's sins can make me suffer. They'll never lose my, make me lose my soul. That's Ezekiel 18, 20. No. <clears throat> We're going to see these cause and effect choices, good and evil, until Right Until God finally eliminates all the evil and the wickedness, until it's a blessed remaking, until we arrive at the final reset, the reward. I, I shared the voices that are crying out in heaven in Revelation 6.10, how long? And God gives an answer in verse 11, wait a little while. Yeah. Now, that's, that's, that's not definitive probably for us, but that's a lot better answer than stop asking. There will be no judgment or vengeance. There will be. You just got to wait. So, so in the meantime, we're trying to make our way, and, and sometimes we have these tear-stained eyes. Please don't be surprised. If you fill in the blanks, that's the first. Don't be surprised by suffering. First Peter, we're in chapter 4 this week, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. I read a story, this is from the, the Cape Times, South Africa, March 23rd of 2004. A South African guy surprises nine men who are trying to rob his house. Nine. And eight of them run off. 
he grabs hold of the last one, and, he's in the door and he throws the would-be robber in a swimming pool. <laughs> and then he realizes the robber can't swim. So the homeowner jumps in to save him, pulls him out of the pool, would-be robber, uh, wet thief, pulls a knife on him, threatens to kill him. So the homeowner said, well, we were still standing near the pool. When I saw the knife, I just threw him back in. (laughs) (laughs) Then he says, but he was gasping for air and drowning, so I rescued him again. And that's the South African. I thought he had a cheek for trying to stab me after I just saved his life. And if you're like me, you you read that and there's a couple of surprises in there. Our law enforcement officials are unmoved. Nope, uh, yep, seen that all the time. <laughs> They're stupid people. Criminals do dumb stuff all the time. You know, I'm not shocked. You know, and that, that's what we're wanting to, to say. We have to approach suffering. Why would this surprise you, really? You know, Jesus was pretty blunt. We've read John 16, 33. I've told you these things. So then in me, you might have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Please, let, let's try to not be surprised that one of Jesus' promises came true. Hmm. Paul sees suffering as a consequence of living in a sin-tarnished, groaning planet. No. But it's also a blessing to be able to experience with those who choose to follow God. This is Romans eight eighteen. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And we always talk about, Paul, what were some of these sufferings that we had? And we say, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was imprisoned, he was left for dead, um, false Christians, hungry, all that for the sake of the cross. He would constantly tell people, Philippians 1, 29, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggles you saw I had, now here I still have. 2 Timothy 3, 12, 13, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving, being deceived. Preacher, old preacher Wayne Smith, he said, look, you're not shocked if you go into the blood bank to get blood. What are they going to do? They're going to stick a needle in your arm and draw blood. You go to the dentist, you're not shocked if they stick a needle in your mouth. And then they drill a hole in your head. You know, that's what they do. It is suffering. <laughs> but what they do promotes life and health. You know? And we read these passages, and we understand these illustrations, and then we go out into the week, and we're like shocked that suffering came my way. Please, n- number two, don't be surprised by the variety of forms of suffering. Back in chapter 1, verse 6, he said all kinds of trials. Here in verse 12, it's painful trials. The original, purosis, fire, pyromaniac. Remember, Peter's writing to people in first century Rome where <laughs> being set on fire is a literal concern. For their faith. You know, if we've been, you look through this book, 1 Peter, that we've been reading, he talks about verbal persecution a lot. Uh, this is in chapter 2, verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, let me see your good deeds. Verse 15, it's God's will. By doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Are there any certainties there? Yes, ignorant accusations of wrongdoing from the mouths of foolish men. Please don't be surprised when you run into that this week. Chapter 3, verse 16, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior may be ashamed. Slander, we always use that. The action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. In chapter 4, in verse 4, he said they heap abuse on you. Now in verse 14, you're being insulted. It happens, young and old alike. And I want to take a minute here to play it's, it's geared for high schoolers, but we can all benefit from the invitation for this Wednesday's See You at the Poll. This, this is their invitation.
And obviously that's geared towards high school. The video, the invitation, you know, see you at the pole means see you at the flagpole outside our school this coming Wednesday morning for Northridge, it's 710. You know, I got a little promotional booklet for the adults and it says be there, encourage them, but it constantly says student led. Let the kids lead. Well, what? You're a high school student. You're walking into a public high school. What might you encounter if you join that? Suffering? I mean, probably a deep term, but you could. You know, insults? More realistic. Mockery? Probably. I, I know this is a big ask. Would I be willing to go? Don't, don't be surprised when people don't understand. You know? And... and Maybe I haven't experienced the same kind of suffering that somebody else has. Uh, Dr. Faust, David Faust says, never minimize the suffering of others because their pain is different from yours. You know, as John would say, minor surgery happens to somebody else. Uh, third, we got, I now have to learn to rejoice in suffering. That's, that's the next level. Um, again, it comes from Jesus, Matthew 5. 11 and 12, that's the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed or blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejo rejoice in week. I don't know if you ever, have you ever felt overwhelmed by a week. Students, collegiate students, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. Be a new parent. <laughs> we are overwhelmed. I did not know they said that the dictionary defines whelmed, the word whelmed, as being turned upside down. So being whelmed is bad enough. <laughs> being overwhelmed, says David Faust, is worse. I think if we were to spend a day, if we, we walked a day in the shoes of law enforcement, uh, teachers, foster care people, aid ministries, uh, homeless shelter volunteers. Just go spend the day at Nationwide Children's and, and walk around there. Tori's next phase of the venture involves a first-hand look at a ministry that helps victims. It's very challenging. There's great potential to be overwhelmed. And yet we all see people who go through these overwhelming things, and they do it with grace and joy and a smile on their faces, usually when I'd put a picture of little Haitian kids up there, you know, smiling. I hope you understood and, and read or looked at the, the update on the next level crisis in Haiti now. There are some paper copies of that, says Lifeline, on the table in the center of the foyer. But understand not only what they are enduring, but we know those people have joy. And, and you always ask that, how, how does somebody endure hardship with an attitude of faith and joy? And they've learned, when I'm in that struggle, I'm actually fellowshipping, I'm connected to Jesus. Uh, verse 13 of this 1 Peter 4 says, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings. You I'd, I've never participated in show choir or theater on the stage in high school. I, I didn't participate. Denise did. Right? So I know that when she goes back to uh, like a high school reunion or goes to, she can visit with people who did participate. And they have a connection, they have a bond, they can share together because they participate in the same things. And if you read verse 13, so you may be overjoyed, when his glory is revealed, do we kind of like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, that's like second coming. You know, that's way down the road. For now, life's just, use your term, crappy or sucky or whatever people say. You know, that's, that's just... It's just the way life is. You know, you get up and it's just a kind of a sad, miserable life until eternity. Day dawns on another 24 hours of misery. <laughs> Did I ever think that my suffering actually does unite me with Jesus even today, reveals God's glory today? I, I thought of Jesus physically suffering on the cross in that agony, and there's a guy right there at the foot of the cross who says, Truly, this man was the son of God. You know? And even in the suffering and the dying, there's people coming to know who God is. And that gives Jesus peace. You know? I, I, 
you always wonder, like, when Jesus said about his friend Lazarus, oh, this sickness will not, not end in death. And then the guy dies. <laughs> and the family's sad, and they're suffering. And then Jesus resurrects him, and there's glory and re- revelation. And when you encounter suffering and you come out of it, and the glory of God is revealed. We all have all these doctors who said, well, there was cancer there. I know there was cancer, and now there's not cancer. Glory of God. And then that same doctor goes into the next room where a Christian family's loved one does die with pain and suffering, and yet they have joy and hope, glory of God. Sometimes we we get so focused on the rain that we miss the rainbow. I've I've learned to stop on the trail and look back. I don't recommend stepping back (laughs) off trails or cliffs, but sometimes you look, turn around, sometimes uh, the, the... best photos are what was actually going on behind me. You know, I had to turn around and and see something that that I didn't see before. Here's this amazing sunset in front of me, but what was happening to the clouds or the rocks or whatever behind? When I'm down and I'm struggling, I'm thankful because I know God is, is there. God is my very present help in times of trouble. God is personally here helping me because I'm down so low there's no human being that's helping me out. We have fellowship with Jesus when we suffer. We, we have <laughs> suffering for, for righteousness' sake. It's rewarded even in the church in verse 14. You know, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. You know? Suffering builds our character, builds, builds our core. You know, I can now do the plank exercise for more seconds than I could before. That's not me. kind of looks like me. But... <laughs> And my time's not a big thing. It doesn't impress the, the high school athletes, but it's big to me. You know? Suffering builds the unity of the church. We, get, we help, like a funeral dinner. We help 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And I thought about this. When's the last time we all pitched in to take a meal to some family that was doing just fine? We don't, you know, it's in time of misery. You know? Suffering gets my focus back. I need God's help. And I know I I spend all this time going, there's blessings and joy and suffering. I know it still hurts. I don't don't deny that at all. It's still painful. I don't enjoy the pain. But I find a peace that passes understanding. How often have we said, pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. I can choose joy over misery. The Holy Spirit is helping. He's crying out, groaning to God in Romans 8. No. Ways that I can't express. Here's another side of the same jewel here, verse f- fourth one. We, we need to make every effort to avoid deserved suffering. <laughs> it's in verse 15. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. You know, do you know anybody here like their, their first inclination is to blame God? But how much human suffering results from the abuse of our own will, our own choice? This is from March 18th of this year. It's down in Florida. It involves a pastor. um, His name was Sean. And this is the article. Boating on Lake Seminole was a delight to Sean and his friend up until the boat began to founder. And he had no life vest. But no worries. Other boaters on the lake called the Pinellas County Sheriff Rescue Team. And on Friday afternoon, shortly after 2 p.m., they were safe on land again. Catastrophe averted. Kiss the earth. But Pastor Sean, 39, evidently wanted more of the same. He called a friend to ferry him back out onto the lake so he could rescue his ship in distress. Okay, well, that's understandable. But again, without a life jacket. Hmm. Around 5.30 p.m., poor Pastor Sean tried to transfer to the little boat and actually capsized it. Not so easy to jump from one boat to another, right? Especially when one is already foundering. Now, poor pastor, they love the fact that this guy's a pastor, they keep saying. Poor pastor Sean was definitely in the drink. No life vest, unable to swim. Hmm. His buddy tried to save him, but was unable to pull the pastor out. And why was he unable to get the pastor out of the water? Because it's super tricky to heave a human body into a boat. It requires strength and patience and practice, and sailors learn to grab a hold of the life vest and forcefully hoist a person in because people don't have handles. So many choice 
points. What? Can't swim? The boat is sinking? You try to rescue it without a life vest? You incautiously plunge into the water? Are you thinking God helps those who hobble themselves? And then they wrote this. The pastor could not walk on water. He could not swim in water. He could not leave the water. The only remaining option was to sink. Pinellas County Sheriff arrived at 542 and rescue divers searched for four hours and finally located the body. Proverbs 19.3 says a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. Do you know anybody like that? We know people like that. Sometimes we're those people. Apologist philosopher Norman Geisler God is not responsible for what people do with their freedom any more than automobile manufacturers are responsible for the accidents that result from reckless driving. Sometimes God voluntarily restrains his power to achieve a higher good. God has self-control, unlike some people. C.S. Lewis wrote this. I thought this was interesting. God has granted human beings the dignity of causality, the privilege of real involvement, in the outcome of events. He invites us to play a role. We reap what we sow, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Alcoholics should not blame God when he's jailed for a DUI. Heavy smokers hypocritical if they're blaming God for lung cancer. Students that put off preparing for a test ought not blame God when you get a poor grade. And I know not not all suffering can be explained like that. Um, Innocent babies suffer and die. King Herod, Matthew 2, that's not their fault. Uh, my dad was mugged more than once. It's never a result of his, his own sins or stupidity. It's the attacker. Um, back in the day, baseball player Dave Dravecki, committed Christian, lost his pitching arm to cancer. You know, just, we're just trying to discern all this. You know. Some suffering comes as a result of my Christian faith. Some suffering comes as a result of living in a broken and sinful world. Some of it comes because I was stupid. If I say my dad was, this is hypothetical, but if I say my dad was mugged those two times in the same parking garage of the same hotel in the same city, and then on his third trip there, he went and parked in that same garage, that's dumb. So here's the last. I, I got to be able to focus on the question I can answer. What part of this can we discuss? This is Deuteronomy 29 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. And we may follow all the words of this law. Trying to figure out the cause. And I put it on the back if you have the insert in your hand or if you download it later uh, from the resources online. We'll put it on the screen here. Uh, Dr. David Faust put that graph together. What causes suffering? Some suffering is a direct result of my own sinful choices. Some suffering is a result of sins committed by other people. Some suffering results from natural laws that sometimes bring harm in a world tainted by sin. Some suffering is attributed directly to the efforts of Satan. Some suffering is understood as God's corrective discipline. And much suffering simply cannot be explained. I just got to trust God. I like this phrase that he used. There's no ouchless answer to suffering. Pain is real. So is God's concern. And even if you were to understand all these intellectual arguments very well, we still struggle. (laughs) emotionally and otherwise, when we or or somebody we love is just writhing in pain. So I want to finish with that. We had the kind of the earlier simple graphic, that earlier diagram. Uh, I call this like napkin theology. Like you could sketch this on a napkin, you know, piece of paper. Uh, God is good. God is all-powerful. Evil exists. And you just draw a cross right in the middle. The cross holds an answer for the problem of evil. And it may not be how you think you would handle it. But that's how God handles it. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we are grateful for uh, all that your word uh, offers to us. Uh, there is much that can be gleaned and discerned and discussed, and we know that there is uh, so much around us that, that will just hit us in the face and zap our strength. Uh, it is, hopefully, it is uh, an encouragement and, and a rejoicing to be gathered here together and to be focused on things that we know are true and eternal, and yet uh, we are probably not very long removed uh, from a pain or a struggle. May we understand how you are using uh, even the reality of evil and suffering. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we do continue to encourage, to challenge, uh, to invite you. Maybe you know that uh, I really need, I need the Lord's help. I, I need to commit to um, his grace and his teaching, and I need to give him my life today. You can come to the front if you have that decision. Uh, let's stand together. We'll sing, we'll come to the altar. There's no better time than now. If you know you need to accept Jesus, don't, don't let that moment pass. Come to him now. Put him first in your life. Don't come when you think you've got it all covered or when you think you're, something's going on in your life that, oh, I, once I get through with that sin, I'll, I'll come to Jesus. Well, come to Jesus now and he'll help you where you are. Come to the altar.
to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to so I wouldn't, I try not to forget some things. Tonight, 7 o'clock, older and younger, both the U67 is a term for middle school and high school, 7 o'clock here tonight. Kingdom Kids is a term for elementary and younger. We'll be here tonight at 7 o'clock as well. See you at the poll. This is Northridge time. It's 7.10 to 7.30. Uh, other schools may vary, but uh, for Northridge, what I have so far is Wednesday morning at 7.10. Uh, stand to reason. Uh, new curriculum for that group. Probably, I think we're going to start next Sunday. So if you want to be a part of that, um, apologetics focus, it'll be in the home builders classroom off the other side of the foyer next Sunday. Uh, got the bonfire fellowship at the Travis's on the 9th. Is there anything else? Concert of prayer this okay. Thursday. Okay. Um, even if, even if um, as a woman of CCAA, you are not a part of the Facebook book prayer group you are invited six o'clock this thursday we are going to have a prayer walk concert of prayer um, at six and then afterwards we're going to eat together so any woman is invited what am i going to eat <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we're going to Canes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you so much, Lord, for uh, this opportunity uh, that we've had together together. Lord, I, I thank you so much for uh, this congregation, for these brothers and sisters, and, and Father, for their faith in you. Uh, Father, I, I thank you so much for the, for the many prayer warriors that we have. Uh, Father, I just pray now that you will just help us to uh, go into the world, to make disciples, to show your love. Father, I just thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your son and that we don't have to fear death because we have life in him. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's close with, O oh Lord, you're beautiful. in